Hi, welcome to the New England chapter of ISA virtual presentation and conference. It is uh, a joy and an honor to have been asked to, hey, wait a minute, huh, keep going. Oh, my mask is on. Oh, okay, that's better. Thanks. Welcome, my name is Melissa Lavangie Ingersoll and during these COVID times, I just wanna say thank you for making the time to join us on this we're all, all in uncharted territories and looking at different ways to provide ourselves education, keep up to date with what we need to know, not only for our own education, but also for those we get to work with and get to coach and mentor. Um, it is a, a joy to have been asked to be providing this education to you on this Tuesday. Well, today's on Tuesday, but <laughs> Tuesday. And uh, we're here from 11.40 to 12.15, so we're here for quite a while. And I have you for all that time. <laughs> anyway, as you things, first things first, uh, uh, we're going to dive right into PPE. Uh, get out of the truck. First thing that goes on is your eyes, your helmet, and um, noting that everyone else has it as well. And it's, it's, it sounds like a silly thing. Um, but what it does is it sets an example, and it sets a precedence, and it sets an attitude, and it sets a, um, a mindset for the crew. So out of your truck beyond just you know taking a couple steps out get yourself relaxed get your equipment get the helmet on and find one that fits you so it's important to understand that we fit it correctly first and foremost that the chin strap is actually fitted properly and this is not a proper fitting chin strap <laughs> if i do that it comes off but i know that many of you out there are already giggling because i look silly doing this but i don't mind um, it's important that not only the chin strap fit, but that if this helmet gets knocked or rocked off, that it's not going anywhere. The whole reason why you have it is to stay on your head. <laughs> so uh, this particular petrol helmet has a couple of adjusters right up here on the, on the forebrow, if you will, on either side of the temple, and you roll them either to or fro to make your, um, the band squeeze against your noggin. No, these aren't eye pro. <laughs> but when they squeeze against your noggin, and so when that happens, you should not have to have your chin strap on super tight. And that is a nice adjustment feature where before, a long time ago, when I first started learning how to climb, you had a chin strap and that was what, what really held your head on beyond the adjustments that weren't on the fly. You had to take off your helmet and sit there and move the band over and clip it down and put it back. And like, no, that's not right. And then somebody messes up the adjustments on you just to get your goat. And you're like, hey, wait a minute. Anywho, so there's all different sorts of adjustments. Now, the other thing that you'll often see a lot, a lot of the time is people wear in their, their helmet like way down here. No bueno. Or the helmets are fit right, but the helmet doesn't fit them. It's either too large. The fit itself of that particular helmet is either too large or too small. And then what you'll find is it does one of these. Well, I know that you know because you're probably giggling right now. But you've seen a lot of people with the tilt back, whether it's here or whatever. No, it's supposed to literally fit low and tight across your forebrow and protect your head. Whether you do or don't have a senna is your own choice, of course, but communications are a fantastic thing. The one interesting thing about this particular helmet is it, it definitely fits different. So some people gravitate to one brand over another. Some gravitate to the way they look. Some gravitate to the way they feel. Find one that you like. Find one that you feel like you're a rock star. Find the color that you like because all of those things matter. If you don't like it, you're less apt to wear it. It's really simple as that. I wanted to make sure that we covered a lot of ground, so that will pop up in a little bit later. And so the biggest thing, again, just to recap, that there are no cracks or dents on the inside and the outside. And stickers are cool, <laughs> uh, but they potentially might hide some cracks and dents. Uh, you obviously want to check out the suspension system, making sure that everything is intact. Of course, as we, as we first noted, is that you want to make sure that it fits properly and that it functions properly. So, helmet, check. Right. Eye protection, uh, we have it. it. It comes in all different shapes and sizes and colors. Even with a mask, you can, get, you can get your eye protection to keep it from fogging. I highly recommend some sort of hard shell, clam shell kind of eye protection that I typically throw that in here. And then I would throw it in my helmet like this. And so they're always together. And then boom, I could find it. They're not going to get crushed. They're not going to get scratched. 
all that kind of stuff. We all we all know. You've been there. Your favorite pair of iPro gets scratched. And you're like, mm -hmm. biggest thing is make sure they fit you. Make sure next is that they are approved. Uh, they they have to be actually stamped. There's a little plastic um, indentation, if you will, where the plastic was molded. That'll say Z87.1 or a plus symbol, which means it exceeds that. And um, there's also typically some other information in there as well. But the biggest thing to understand is that you have a pair that you like and that you have a pair that fits you very well. And more importantly, that you have a pair that you look like a rock star in. Now, it's a little bit of a giggle factor, but you know it's true. If you put on a pair of eye protection and you don't like the way you look, are you going to wear them? Probably not. The next thing, is, of course, is try to wear a tint as dark as the conditions allow. In other words, if you are outside in a full sun day, try to wear a darker lens. If you're on a, in a very uh, low light situation, try to wear as much pigment uh, in the lens as possible that still allows you to see and does not impede, impede your vision. Uh, hearing protection. Um, what, what, well, we all know about hearing protection, but in terms of uh, all the things that we've already discussed, again, just make sure it works for you. Make sure that it's actually sealing around your ear if you're wearing muffs. Believe it or not, it's recommended that you change the hygiene kits about every six months. Most people don't know that. Uh, most people only go to change the hygiene kits when they get stanky, uh, and then you're carrying around your helmet like this. <laughs> so that's really important to know. Uh, your hygiene kits can be washed. Uh, the idea is, of course, that they spring back or the foam has uh, some resiliency. If they're not springing back, then that is definitely a time where you want to get another pair. Oh, back to helmets. You can wash your helmets with just soap and water, uh, lukewarm water, and, and uh, a non-abrasive dish soap works really great. If you want it to smell good, throw some essential oil on the chin straps. It does a great job. Um, with that also being said, going back to your hearing, um, it's important to wear as much uh, hearing protection as possible, even with low, constant noise. Uh, it is a shell. Um, employers must provide some sort of protection against that exposure of sound. Uh, we can't remove those objects from our job sites. Uh, there's a lot of equipment that we use on a regular basis that we just can't remove to reduce the sound. So therefore, we put guards against our ears to protect that. Muffs, however, protect that little bone behind your ear that also protects the, the vibration. And so that is very important to understand that it's a nice addition to plugs. So they do, they both protect your hearing, but they protect your hearing in two different ways. Keep that in mind. All right. So we're going to dive into the next thing. Cordage. Cordage is up next. <laughs> uh, we're going to go over climbing lines, hitch cords, lanyards, rigging lines, and of course, webbing. And Okay, so going into climbing lines. The biggest thing about climbing lines is they're not all created, created equal. Cordage, hitch cords, lanyards, rigging lines, they're not all created equal. So it's important to understand what line, what construction you have of your line, how that construction, how does it actually work? Um, is it a core over a cover? Is it just a braided line? Does it have any core at all? Does it have this many strands or that many strands? And lots of people right now just went, oh, I hate this part. Some of you are like, ooh, tell me more. Uh, it's, it's really interesting because um, our brains will either connect to data or let it go when we're not needed. But it's important because this is what's holding up your life. So with that being said, I'm going to grab some cords and come right back. Maybe you can get a drink of water. So in my lab back here, I have lots of different cords just hanging from the ceiling and in addition which you can't see down there on the floor I have more cords as well <clears throat> I'm gonna start off with something pretty fun and colorful this particular cordage is made by Teufelberger slash New England I say slash because they are now or one and the same, same company. And um, the neat thing about this particular rope is the name. 
Uh, well, frankly, it's pretty too, but color. Uh, color is really visible. Um, now a lot of companies have gone to more of trying to color scheme their lines when they have smaller crews to make it easier. So a lot of folks will say red is rigging or, or other colors do X, Y, Z. So sometimes red isn't necessarily preferred as a climbing line, but if you're a smaller company, people quickly can recognize your, your stuff and what you use it for. But um, why is this so nice is because it was one of the first ropes on the market that allowed for a, if you will, a hybrid or a dual purpose line that allowed you to do a couple of things. You could not only use mechanicals on it, but you could also uh, use hitch cords and it also ties well to itself. Why, when we're looking at rope inspection, gear inspection for ropes, what are we actually looking for? Well, this particular cordage, not only is the color really cool, uh, the biggest thing is to understand that this is a, a double braided line, which means that there's an outside and an inside. Secondly, uh, you, when, you're, when you're inspecting these lines, you're going to start from one side of the line and look at the, if it has a splice, whether it's sewn or if it is spliced. You're going to look at the eye, and you're going to make sure that all of the stitching is intact, uh, all of the whipping is intact as you're inspecting it, that it's also uniform. I have seen very rarely times where, as a climber will come down out of trees, that this will truly be pitched in one direction or another. In the grand scheme of things, you really want to be looking also to see if there's actually any more stretches going on where there's anything that's been broken. And that's why that those covers or the shrink wrap has been put over the top of it to protect those. Because obviously, we climb trees, tree barks are rough. <laughs> they provide quite a bit of abrasion for anybody who has taken a, a ride on a branch and stepped up your arm here or your leg, you know. So make sure that they're intact. Um, the other thing that we're going to be looking at, again, if it's, if it's a hand-spliced eye, is that not only that whipping is intact, but it is complete. If it doesn't have this guard on there, that that is tr truly present. Now, why? Well, in this particular case with the hand splice, those, those whippings, if you will, are not there to add strength to the line. What those are doing, though, is telling you what's happening on the inside of the line. These things hold our life. So many of us, when we're climbing and inspecting our gear for climbing lines and rope, we aren't necessarily checking the eye. And if your rope does have an eye, it's important to understand what to look for. So you also want to make sure that the rope around the eye, if you will, is uniform. There's no herniation. There's nobody bulging out or trying to get out of the rope. Um, that also that all of the cordage is intact and that it's not abraded, which sounds like a dumb moment, but Captain Obvious prevails and is here to tell you that the cordage has got to be intact. The other thing, too, is you want to make sure that there's no dirt and crud and grime and grit and all that kind of stuff inside the eyes. And over time, that does build up. And how do you get that out of there? Well, maintenance is one of the things beyond just inspecting our gear. Well, frankly, give it a bath. These ropes can get, get washed. It's, it's totally fine. Some of the things that I've learned over the years is, frankly, you want to avoid, don't want to put your stuff into washers, the front loaders or these lines, a wonderful bath in a green landscape barrel, a big old bucket with a, some cool water in a, a truly a, not even a cap full of simple green or some, you know, there are some rope manufacturing washers out there as well that are designed for haha, rope. And frankly, they're, they're there for a reason. There's no harsh or abrasive chemicals in them and they lift and separate the dirt from the lines. And you'll find after you've had a, a really nasty line, whether it's the eye or the cordage itself, that after you've given it a bath, you uh, rinse it, get all the dirt out, rinse it out, put some clean water in there, rinse it out again, maybe one more time, and then hang it around your property in the shade or in your garage in the shade or away from oil and anything, grease, and just let it drip dry. You're going to be amazed. Not only the color, the stink is <laughs> gone and also the vibe, the feel of how your cordage behaves again. Now keep in mind that not all of the whipping on hand spliced uh, products are actually on the outside. Some of them are actually inside with hollow braids, with uh, different construction lines. So again, you got to know what you're looking for. So um, pretty lovely, pretty line. The next thing that you want to do is, frankly, you want to feel what the line feels like. 
as I'm taking my hand and strumming it over the cordage, I don't want to feel any bumps or lumps or flat spots or glazing, that hard crusty bit where somebody came down way too fast and actually melted the cordage. I'm feeling for any sort of picks. And what I mean by picks is potentially a piece of equipment actually took a piece of uh, one of the one of the strands of line, like say for example a white one there, and actually poked out. Many of you have seen that, so you don't want those. You want to make sure it feels contiguously from start to finish like, well, a rope. <laughs> that, is, that it feels similar all the way through, and there's nothing inconsistent about it. Um, but again, I'm going to start at the eye. Uh, these are all sewn eyes. Some of the labels make it difficult to see, but most manufacturers, whomever is sewing, does a nice job at trying to make sure that the label only covers one side of the stitching so that you can inspect the other side of the stitching. Um, with that being said, this one is hand sliced, so you'll see that my whipping is on the outside. It does not have a protective sheath on the outside, so it's extremely easy to inspect. And um, the other thing that I'm looking for, again, is so that the rope feels uniform, that it's consistent all the way through. There's no picks, there's no jags, there's no uh, cuts, abrasions, there's no flat spots, there's no bulging, no herniation, consistent all the way through. But you can see that that, that cordage is not only used, but um, it's well loved, but it's got a lot of life in it. Now, a lot of people say, well, okay, I've got a hitch cord, it's dirty, as, and I need to take care of it. I said, well, that's okay, you have a sink. Throw it with some lukewarm water and a teeny bit of, again, either simple green or non-detergent uh, soap, a mild soap. Throw that puppy right in the water and give it a bath with your hands. Get, get all scrubby out of there. Um, you'll also find that depending on the hitch cord, some hitch cords have a, a propensity or some behavioral uh, characteristics where they'll start to flatten once they've been used quite a bit. And the big thing to understand is that these hitch cords, again, they need to be working in tandem and they need to be round. Now, HRC, which is uh, a Teufelberger product, um, I like quite a bit. Uh, I will say this, though, over time, once it starts to break in, it does flatten. And so I've noticed that when I'm climbing on a hitch cord that I have not taken some time to give some love to, that that hitch cord will, again, not only flatten, but start to creep. So when I'm climbing, I'll, it won't hold as I go up or as I go to sit back, back down after I've dressed my knot, it just starts to wiggle my way down and all of a sudden I'm like, hey, wait a minute. So once I'm in a safe position, typically when I've either finished the climb or if it's, if it's bad, I will be stay up in the tree and untie my hitch cord and then simply go back to third to fourth grade whenever you learn clay you put the cordage between your two hands and you act like you're making clay worms. And all you're gonna do is massage the cordage so you get to a point where now your cordage is back to round. Now, surprising how well that works. And basically what you're doing is you're putting the cover and the core back into uniform together. You're putting them back into harmony so they can work together as a team. Um, and then once you tie your cordage back on for the rest of your climb, you're like, oh. So it makes a difference. But note that when you finish that climb, that should be put into the, the little lunch bag. Now lanyards. I am going to grab my lanyard. On my harness. <clears throat> now, a wise woman once taught me in a very simple way, and to quote that woman, her Krista Stratting is uh, not only a very talented arborist, but also a hoot and a half. If you don't know her, hopefully you'll get to meet her soon. She has this uh, thought about how to set up her harness, and I can't agree with her more. And ironically, without even realizing it, I do the same thing, which is sharps on one side, sauce on the other. In other words, keep them separate. Don't stow your saw or sharp objects on the side that you have your lanyard. Now, Many of you out there know climbers that you either climb with, or maybe yourself, that um, constantly nick uh, their lanyard with their handsaw. And oftentimes it comes to stowing. Right. 
either pulling the saw out or again putting it back in the scabbard sewing. So it's important to understand that that is avoidable if you create some good work habits. One of the other work habits that I really enjoy about my lanyard <clears throat> is about trying to keep out the excess and stowing the excess that I don't need while I'm in operation. So um, you'll see after I take my, my lanyard off my harness that um, <laughs> you can see which parts I use more frequently than others. So here's my lanyard. It's on my right side. Uh, let me take that off and we'll go through lanyards because lanyards are a little bit of a different animal. Um, and why I say that is I put those things down. <clears throat> My lanyard system's uh, pretty simple. I like a long lanyard because, frankly, I like to have a, if you will, a baby climbing line. Uh, I'm of the old guard where I learned moving rope system and I'm working my way into single rope uh, and I really love it. But with that said, I'm also learning different work practices. So keeping that in mind, uh, I'd like to have a baby climbing line. So my lanyard typically is anywhere between 25 and 30 feet and then what I daisy chain up the amount that I don't need. And then when I do need it, I just take it off my harness and pull out what I need and then hang it back on and it cinches, which is one of the neat things about understanding how to use rope, right? But because I tend to use one side more than other, the other, you'll see that this one is worn much considerably in the past. But that's why this is here. It's showing you on purpose. And um, I uh, have a hitch climbing pulley on my lanyard system, again, because it's a baby climbing line as well. But I also have other pieces of equipment. Now, whether it's a climbing line, whether it's a hitch cord, or whether it's a lanyard, these are still all soft parts, and these all still need to be inspected. So I would actually take the time to take them off and give it a good look. Now, when you inspect other people's equipment, it does two things. One, they look at it with a different lens because they're looking at it not being familiar with all the things and bits and history and uh, emotion, good and bad, that you've experienced while climbing trees. And so when somebody else is looking at your gear, they don't have the ventured emotional interest that you may have in your equipment. So they'll come across something, not that, that's not too much worn, there's some dirt spots, excuse me, some soil spots on that. But again, it's in good condition, there's nothing torn, it's all round. There's no abrasions, no nicks, no scuffs, no scrapes. I'm going to put that aside. <clears throat> However, somebody might take this part and look at that. This is actually pitch, but look at that pitch and kind of just make them kind of go, hmm, slow down a little bit. And then as they're looking through the inspection process, they might come across one of these little strands right here that are has been picked or broken. And then they'll say, <clears throat> I don't know if you're... Y'all can see that. There we go. Now, 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 granted, it's not a very bad pick. Uh, and how do I use that in terms of qualifying? Well, this particular cordage is made of 24 strands, hence why we have to know how our lines are made and how many strands are doing what and when. And this cordage is made of 24 strands, and I have two very small picks here, but they're not full broken strands. And so from experience, I know that un just well under well, 90, I would say 98% of the strands are still intact. So is my rope still good? The answer is yes. However, it definitely is a bath. Um, however, you will find that when you're do doing a gear inspection for somebody else, you'll come across either a full strand that has been picked out and broken because you're holding it or you're holding more than one and so those are the questions that a lot of times people get stuck on is like oh, how many strands are okay and is that bad or is that good well frankly if you've got 24 strands and you're dealing with a 10 percent threshold well you know 2.4 percent st strands in, a, in an area where the pattern uh, does not repeat now, this might be too much information, but basically when the strands are cut too close together, you're now you're getting into a danger zone. 
safety blue, uh, which is one of the oldest lines on the market that out there that we have climbed with as, a, as an industry, was made for a certain reason. It's a 16 strand line, climbing line. It comes in high V, which is that orange and white. It comes in all white, which is again called safety blue. And it also comes in ultra V, which is that high, high neon safety yellow greeny color, also with white. And why it's called safety blue is because it's actually the core, the inside of it, the core strands are blue. And the thought process is that if the rope was to be cut and you could see the blue strands, that it'd be time to retire that section of rope. Not necessarily the whole rope. And if the rest of the rope was usable, then that's fine, but at least that section of rope. But now you'll see the other end of my line is, well, frankly, quite pink. So gives you an idea. So uh, climbing lines, hitch cords, same. Uh, lanyards, same. Rigging lines, same. Even more so. Rigging lines, uh, not only is our, excuse me, the climbing lines and lanyards and hitch cords are our lifeline, but we're not putting huge amounts of forces on our material, which is very strange when you think about it, that somebody might take a climbing line and they're not comfortable putting their life on it anymore, but then they'll turn around and rig or, you know, lower a piece of wood that is, you know, four or five, sometimes six times heavier than we are. So keep that in mind. But uh, webbing, which is our next case in point. Whether it's a webbing loop, Items that are, again, that are rated, that have uh, actual, their, their stitches, is, and they're rated to be a minimum break strength for our work. Frankly, uh, they could be used for so many different items. They could be used for light rigging. They can be used as um, friction savers for our cells. They could be used as redirects for our cells. We can put our life support on them. Um, it is depending on which ones you have. Some of them are not rated. So it's important to understand what gear you're buying. Look for the tags, look for the strength or decors on them. And then a lot of times what you'll see, this is, this is fairly brand new. You can see there's hardly any discoloration on it whatsoever. Whereas I, again, hold up this red piece, you can start to see quickly and sound effects, always fun. Um, yeah, you'll find, again, that webbing, once it gets used, its stress points or its wear points are its perimeter, the outside, the margins. And so you might start to get some picks and frays and things might get a little bit soft on the outside. So what you're looking for, again, same with, cord with rope, any cordage, that it's uniform, it's consistent, uh, that it has all of the marks and stitches are intended as designed, that they're there, you'd be surprised, that they're there and that they're all intact and that the margins also are intact. Now, whether it's webbing like this or webbing on your harness, which we'll get to in a minute, the threshold is that you don't want any more than 10% of the amount of webbing that you have gone or eroded. Well, duh, you think, oh my God, 10%. Well, it's a threshold. Uh, will the product break? Probably not, but this is your life. And so, frankly, these pieces of equipment are literally like 6 to $12 for some brands. Other brands, they go upwards depending on the strength ratios of them. So there's many different uh, aspects of pieces of gear that you're buying, but understand that they all have thresholds. Now, we'll go into the next point, which is you can overload these. You can break the stitching. I've done it, not on purpose. And um, so it's important to understand how those tools not only react once they are stressed to that point, but also understand about when they're time to retire them. Which brings us into a very similar uh, frame of mind, which is again, rope, webbing, uh, and then hardware, and then again, span of life to harnesses, which again is, is a different, um, additional add. So we're taking the individual components and making things into them so there are systems, and I really want to point out that word again, systems, putting them into systems which really makes another add-on. So we're going to talk about bridges next. So grabbing my harness again, um, 
all harnesses are not created equal. So it's important to understand what, what harness A that, again, fits you, that you like, and that um, it is comfortable in many different situations, whether it's pruning, cabling, uh, if you're doing lightning installations, whether you're doing crane work, whether you're, um, whatever you're doing. And you want to make sure that that harness that you're purchasing works for all different applications, not just one. Because boy, oh boy, it's not fun to understand that when you're uh, typically doing a lot of stationary work and then you start doing single line work that your bridge is not necessarily, it's either too long or too short or it's hardware and it doesn't interface well with the system. So it's important to understand your select rate, rate harness for you. This harness for me, um, again, I'm a, I'm a big fan. I wear many different harnesses. I have the, the pleasure and honor to, to, again, sell gear, so I get to wear a lot of different things. I have many other different harnesses. This is just one of them. Um, this particular one is uh, manufactured by Nutrad. This is called the Onyx, and this has a rope bridge. Um, so, again, going back into basics in terms of what we're looking for, um, there, I did just recently buy a new bridge um, because you'll see, as I hold this up, that you'll see some discoloration going on there. And you'll also start to see that it's starting to flatten. Now, a rope bridge, uh, a, a rope bridge, uh, is just a section of line. But I want to say something really important, that all rope bridges don't interface with other harnesses. So all rope is not necessarily designed to be in an application to be on a harness. So you match whatever your harness came with and say, for example, you fell in love with this piece of purple cordage and you're like, I want that one on my harness. I don't want green, I want purple. Well, reach out to the manufacturer that makes your harness first and ask them, is it appropriate if I use that particular line, the purple line, on my harness? Can I do that? And get that in writing. Only at that point would then you could use it as a bridge. And I really want to punctuate that point. These are designed as a system. They're tested as a system. It's not appropriate for you to put any other bridge on that that, came, that did not, not come with the harness. You want to use what came with the harness. Replace what it came with. If you're unsure, ask the manufacturer on, or if you ask us, uh, get your gear purveyor, whomever that is. Um, and if for whatever reason, if you can't get an answer from us or we don't know, we'll go right to directly to the, the creator of the harness. So that's very, very important. Um, with a moment and a pause of uh, severity, people have died by making choices that didn't match. So ensure you're making the right choice. Okay, with that being said, so um, I wanted to leave this on here to show you, as I bring that a little bit closer to the camera, that it is discolored. And you'll also start to see some flattening here. And one of the other things you'll start to see is just a little bit of the uh, glazing. Now, I could take that off and give it a bath, but frankly, this is inexpensive. <laughs> this is under 20 bucks to get a new bridge. $20. Hmm. Anybody get a new bridge? I already did. So I will put that on before my next climb. Um, I have a piece of hardware on here. Some harnesses come with hardware, some don't. Some, you know, they're, it's, again, it's personal preference. Some people like it, some people don't. Some people will just put their hardware directly onto their harness. It's, it's your personal preference. Um, I personally like hardware. So with this being said, is I, if I'm looking at this bridge, which is rope, and I've got a small compact swivel on my harness bridge, I'm also then going to be looking at wear and tear on this as well because obviously that is flattening. This is putting pressure on that. I've got some wear on my, on my swivel. So we'll get in that in hardware in a minute. Obviously, I want to be making sure that if I'm tying knots at the end, that I have an extent, they're, they're extended at the end, that these are not so close to here, um, that that's going to back out. So you want to have at least three, two, three inches on the end of it, not little stubbies. Um, and then additionally, uh, if some, some of them, you'll find that rope, uh, rope bridges will actually have sewn terminations, and they'll sew them either around hardware or there'll be hardware that actually can open to receive sewn items so uh, you're going to be looking at the stitching right so basically all it is is an eye to eye right 
sewn one on, on one side, sewn on the other side, and you're going to look at, again, hit repeat. We're going to look to make sure all the stitching is continuous. We're going to make sure that there's no fraying. We're going to make sure that all the stitching is intact. Uh, if it does have a shrink tube on there or the coating on the outside to protect it, it's nice that it stays there. If it doesn't, that's okay too, in terms of it didn't come with it. Um, and make sure that, again, the bridge is round, that it's not flattened, that it's not discolored, that it doesn't have any nicks and tears and what have you. Most specifically, too, no, no cuts, no abrasions, no anything. Like, it's not even a 10% threshold. This is your bridge. It's your lifeline. There's only one of them. With that punctuation point of there's only one of them, there are other harnesses. Give me one moment. <clears throat> that also have, that come with, She's out of the camera. She's in the camera. <laughs> that come with more than one bridge. So uh, Petzl does that with their Sequoia. Tree Motion Evo does that with their harness. Um, the Tree Rex by Edelrid does this. Um, it has this bridge. It has an SRT attachment bridge. And then it has an additional bridge that you can add on as well. So you can run two bridges or three bridges. And there's a reason why this is happening. What we're finding is that in our industry, <clears throat> we don't have any backups. We don't have any additional ads to increase safety. And it's not a, it's not a shall, it's not a should. It's just what a lot of users are noting that it's nice to have a backup. Harness hardware. Uh, whether you're in uh, an Edelrid Tree Rex, We've got hardware all over the place. Let's start with the beginnings is frankly, there's just buckles, right? So the way we actually get into our harnesses, um, we have different ways to do that. <clears throat> uh, this one, you actually step into the center, which is nice and easy. And then the hardware, um, when it cl collapses or connects over on this particular harness, where are you? Is on my side. Some buckles have, if you will, like a depression in, in the center, uh, excuse me, in the center, and that you will slide it through and connect. So all harnesses don't connect or the fasteners are not all the same. So make sure you're very familiar with how they connect and unconnect. I know that sounds really funny or silly, but um, it's important <laughs> to make sure it fits correctly and that it's fastened correctly because the way you might adjust or inspect that would be different than you do another one. Hardware, whether you're your D-rings and or your lower paws, if you have any hardware on the bottom of the lower Ds, where it should be right around your hip flexor area. Um, these are very critical points, obviously. This is for um, your lanyard points, and you want to make sure that, again, there's no burrs, there's no... Um, abrasions or there's no missing metal. Uh, additionally, when you're inspecting your harness, this sounds really, this is a brand new harness, so as you can tell, but when you pull back your D-rings, you're also making sure that you pull out the forest underneath that's hiding underneath there, whether it's wood chips or branches or sticks and stones and all different sorts of other things. You'd be amazed at how much material collects under these, uh, under these soft points and under the hard points. And if you don't take the time to clear those out with either a soft toothbrush or just, you know, wipe it away or even some com compressed air, how much that collects. And frankly, anybody that has any twigs and things like that, either in your uh, under ruse or your upper or lower under ruse, uh, you'll know that you don't like it there for very long and you'll spend some time to wiggle it out. So same thing with your harness. It just is abrasive. It, it wears away at fabric and it wears away at the webbing straps and it wears away at all of the points of connection. Uh, additionally, you know, there are reasons why there are these things called bar tacks when you're sewing. Those are there for, of course, security for life support. So all of that forest that we collect as we're in the trees abrades on that, and that's important to understand. So keep that in mind as well. This particular harness, again, is a, 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 a baby version of mine. This is a size zero for itty bitty smaller people. Um, 
one of the things that I absolutely adore about uh, working with people to teach them about how to climb trees is that they are so enthusiastic and, ex and excited about being in trees that sometimes they forget that the things that they are wearing need a lot of love and support. <laughs> and oftentimes when I get the equipment back upon inspection, I find mm. treats. And this is one of the treats that I kind of bristled about, but it, it happens. So um, I don't, as you can see, this little pink flag is here to indicate it, but this is again hardware that we're inspecting, whether it's a, a side D or lower D or the ring that might be on your harness. You're inspecting for any wear and tear, you know, normal friction points of your either your rope snap or your carabiner that might uh, attach to these steel rings or aluminum rings. Um, you will see some natural abrasion that occurs between the interfacing of the metal. However, um, you basically don't want, again, missing metal. So once we start to get percentages, you know, again, these things would take a lot of force to break. But the fact of the matter is you don't want to ever have to sit there and go, hmm, is today the day that's going to break? Um, that would be a, a very bad day. But I'm going to slowly draw this forward to you because I want you to see this. I'm hoping that you can see that well. As I pitch that to the side a bit, you'll see that there is a quite a divot there and quite a bit of metal missing. And as I move that back to the white sheet, I don't know if you can see that silver mark from the black, but this we took this harness out of service, frankly, because this has got to be inspected by the manufacturer. And I don't know if, I don't think that they can just replace this one particular piece of hardware. So this whole harness might, may have to go away, which would make me very sad because I like it very much. Um, lifespans of certain hardware, you're going to see over time metal changing colors. Again, whether it's the exposure of metal to metal wearing down the anodization or the color of di different items. Certain harnesses come with rings that are either yellow or green or red, depending on where they're located and, and they have different functions, but depending on where they're located, some have more wear than others. Uh, take an example, um, Petzl Sequoia. They have these rings that open on the bottom of the lower Ds, and those are allowed to connect into for another type of lower um, lanyard position and or work position. So they're very comfortable. It changes the sit position in the harness, but you'll find that the color changes. So they go from this beautiful bright yellow color to like this bronze, steely looking thing, and you're kind of like, hmm, is that okay? Well, fr fact of the matter is, is mm, I can't speak for all, but I know that Petzl has a lifetime warranty on all their metal parts. With that being said, that you're constantly doing maintenance and that you're constantly doing inspections. So note that these, these tools, whether it's New Tribe, whether it's Buckingham, whether it's Petzl, whether it's Teufelberger, whether it's Camp or... Um, Edelred, all of these different manufacturers have certain specifications. They come with these manuals, that little thing I tossed aside, read those, know what a piece of equipment are rated for, why, and how long they have a lifespan for. But when in doubt, slow down and ask. Uh, there's reasons why. There's span of life for things. So keep that in mind. All right. Um, shackles. Um, some harnesses actually have shackles and I will you'll see on the slide when it appears on the screen here that there are two shackles shown in this particular picture and the shackles frankly as many of you know but they're basically just open uh, U's if you will that have a pin that goes through one part and then it screws into a receiver on the other side of the pin well a colleague of mine came in and said um can you inspect these? I don't think this is right. And I went, whoa. So you'll see the picture on the slide that'll pop up that this person um, ended up taking a, a small, uh, basically uh, one foot drop in a harness when they had a sucker uh, break out. Um, they, uh, they were also tied over a, an appropriate tie-in point, but they had grabbed a sucker without even realizing it and had pulled a line over that. And as they elevated their position in the tree, it broke the sucker and it dropped into his harness. And when he dropped into his harness, he actually distorted the lower shackles, which you think about like, wow, 
but the amount of force that we can put onto our tie-in points and into our harness and our bodies is pretty significant. So understand that even something so strong as a stainless steel shackle can also be tweaked. And though it was still functioning appropriately, it was definitely, um, you'll see in the picture, is, uh, is warped, it's, it's, it's expanded. And asked me, is that okay? And I said, well, let me ask you something really funny. He goes, sure, what's that? I said, when's the last time you did gear inspection? He goes, uh, that was a couple months ago. I said, okay, so when you actually went to go take the shackles off, was the, the bolt actually loose to undo? And he says, yeah, it's weird. Why would you ask that? And I said, well, frankly, to have a shackle distort like that with probably 800 to 1,000 pounds of dropping mass force into that, that seems very difficult to do. So that says to me that the reason why that shackle deformed was that it wasn't orientated, it wasn't being used in its proper design, which means it was entirely closed. And many different hardwares, depending on what you use in your harness, that can open it's important to look at their manufacturer's recommendations about whether they do or don't suggest you use blue Loctite. Blue Loctite is designed to actually come undone, but not on its own. It's, you can undo it when you put in some brute force. But there are other, other devices that can open, for example, like the, the Sequoia open rings that are designed not to be used, not to be used, with any Loctite because they actually have O-rings and bushings in there that when you when you seal them down that those actually allow it to grip, if you will. If you put Loctite in there, you'll defeat the purpose and actually not uh, use the tool as intended. Okay. Going back to our harnesses. <coughs> so when we pick up our harness, we go back into all the webbing and again, beyond moving our hardware out of the way and clearing out our forest on either side of the webbing, you actually want to peel back the webbing itself too, under all of the buckles, under all of that, under any place that can have some looseness to them, and that you make sure again that they're that they're all sewn and intact, and that they are looking as intended. And I know that sounds really silly, but you'd be surprised <laughs> if you've done more than one or two gear inspections. You know what I'm talking about. The other thing, of course, too, is when you when the webbing leaves the harness and it's actually attaching on to parts that move, for example, the lower paws and or um, the buckles that fasten. Again, you want, you'll actually, when you're doing a full gear inspection, you'll actually want to loosen up these attachment points and put slack into the system and peel those back and actually loosen it up and move things around. Not only to look at the hardware, but also to look at that webbing. And similar to that story I told earlier about the webbing that went through the lower paws on that uh, climber's uh, tree motion standard, you're looking to see how that webbing is interfacing where it meets the hardware. So you want to make sure all that webbing is intact. Some harnesses you can replace different pieces of webbing. Some of them you can't. Um, and it's just a function of how they manufacture them. So there are pros and cons to each harness, of any harness, what it is. Some pieces are replaceable, some pieces are not replaceable. Uh, do, do harnesses actually expire? Well, manufacturers have different rules about them. Some actually state that they have a, a shelf life for their harnesses. Uh, some of them are 10 years, some of them are five years. So it's important to understand what your manufacturer says for your harness. The harnesses that don't have shelf lives, if you will, or an, a lifespan to them, the biggest thing is to understand with your regular and in gear inspections beyond the every day, every climb before and after, that in your monthly gear inspections, you're going to be extremely thorough to go through those because these pieces of equipment are not only expensive, but they can last you a lifetime if you care for them. Most people, if they're going to be climbing every single day, or at least on the better part of 20 to 30 hours a week, you'll get comfortably about five years out of a harness, sometimes a little bit more if you're very good at taking care of your equipment. And the reason I say it's just about five years is you're going to naturally feel the fibers start to break down and get softer and not give you the comfort and support it did when it was once new. So you'll just naturally feel the degradation of, of pieces of the, the soft goods, if you will, start to break down. 
And when those soft goods start to break down, they interface differently with the hardware. And so you might start to feel a pinch in your side or you might start to feel a little bit more pressure on your hip. Um, and you'll, that will naturally occur with the different uh, breakdown of the harnesses. So most climbers can get comfortably anywhere between uh, about a year to a few years on a climbing line if they're using it every single day. Uh, folks who are running cranes are going to be running through climbing lines a lot more frequently just because of the constant up and down and in terms of the rapid succession of the ups and downs, but just a general rule of thumb. Okay, uh, note that your harnesses are also have born on dates. Most of them are, they're d in different locations. Some of them are tucked under webbing. Some of them are peeled back under leg straps but they will give you uh, the date that that harness was made. So you find out where that is located on your harness. Some people don't even know. <laughs> Some people had no idea what that was about. Um, note that. And when you are doing your monthly gear inspections and you do get a new harness, put that down and record that. It's amazing when, <laughs> when we uh, are a part of a piece of equipment or a part of something in our lives that we touch or use every single day and you might come across an old receipt or somebody said, oh yeah, you got that rope two years ago. And you're like, what, two years ago? No, I didn't. So like, oh yeah, you got that one we did in X, Y, and Z training when so-and-so came in and did the EHAP training. You had got that rope a couple days after because they DQ'd your line. You're like, oh my God, you're right. Those are the kinds of fun information that documentation can give you is in terms of lifespan and um, use, um, how often you're using them. So important to keep in mind. And hardware. So um, hardware with ascenders, carabiners, ropes, snaps, pulleys, general life support, and uh, ring and ring friction savers. So we're going to get into ascenders. And really one of the biggest things that I want to point out to folks is, you know, we used to climb all rope all the time. A closed moving rope system was just one big giant piece of circle that we tied to us and then tied to itself. And then as we wore the friction hitch out, we would cut that off. <laughs> And then our climbing line would get smaller and so forth and so forth. Well, with the, the innovations of climbing and the awesome brains that are out there always trying to innovate and trying to come up with new techniques and new systems about how to make ourselves efficient and how to do work with less perceived work, uh, we come up with some really cool stuff. And some of those things we come up with are frankly different types of systems and now ascenders. Moving away from split tails and and eye and eye friction hitches, ascenders have really taken over our industry in so many different ways. And frankly, one thing is this this body part right here, <laughs> this body part and this body part. Your shoulders and your elbows uh, take a pretty good beating when you're constantly pulling, sliding up your friction hitch, or pull pull pull, flake flake flake, pull pull pull, flake 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 it's important to understand that that friction's got to go somewhere and your soft parts of your body are receiving that friction also. So ascenders make it a lot easier to not only tend, sometimes they tend themselves, and more importantly when you're adjusting your friction either going out on a limb or coming back on a limb to adjust or take up the slack is much easier with a mechanical ascender. Well, just like with anything else, they also have their downsides. And their downsides about uh, mechanical ascenders is that is your vice. So a lot of times if you're starting to get into using ascenders for the first time, you're not really sure what to look for. Um, you may also not know that the mechanical ascenders actually are best paired with certain climbing lines, um, best paired with also different types of hardware that you wear on your person, for example your harness also paired with uh, good pieces of hardware that mate well with that in terms of carabiners or snaps in that particular case. Some play nice and some don't. And you won't really know that until you either learned it from somebody else that knows or learned it from somebody else that learned the hard way and wore out a piece of a gear or wore out the snap or wore out the ascender or uh, cho chose a line that was either too small in diameter or too large in diameter and then the device didn't work well and either scared the bejesus out of you because you went down really way too fast, you descended too fast, or there was just so much drag on the device, you're like, what the heck is so special about this? So it isn't until you get to learn all the different nuances of that kind of stuff and you're like, how am I supposed to learn all of that? I've just been climbing for six months. Or 
I've been climbing for five years, or I've been climbing for 40 years, and these darn new fandangle descender things. There's all different sorts of learning curves. So when, when you're not sure, ask. But with that being said, what most people think of when they first hear the word ascender, they think of a hand ascender. Whether you're using a hand ascender or whether you're using a mechanical right ascender like the Rock Exotic or Kimbo or a half inch rope wrench for a half inch line or you're using 11 millimeter or 7 16 rope wrench or a zigzag whether it's for a moving rope system or again we could set up this also as a single line there are many different options out there how do you know how do you know how to inspect it well frankly there's manufacturer specifications there's rules and there's not rules there's uh, manuals that come along with them and it's important that you read them it's also important that if you decide that you're going to invest in one of these tools spending anywhere from $125 upwards of a lot more, can be upwards of $350-ish, that you're picking the right tool for you. And if you don't know, just ask a whole bunch of questions. Specifically, when you start shopping for them beyond what your colleague may be using or what you saw on a YouTube video or whatever, Ask lots of questions. Try to get in touch with that person that had that impact on you. Like, that looks so awesome. Like, why, why is that tool so great for you? Like, tell me about it. That kind of information gives you the groundwork to ask questions. And most specifically, what they're going to tell you is, like, for example, like the zigzag, when you pull down on the lever, it releases really quick and easy. Well, as you can imagine, it looks looking like a bicycle chain. Pretty straightforward for the most part. But the friction has to come from somewhere. And frankly, they goes through these friction plates inside here. Well, when you, depending on what lines you're running with them and depending on what application you're doing with them, you're going to wear those friction points out either sooner or later, depending on the rope that you've, you've paired it with, depending on the way you use it, whether you're on a crane or not on a crane, whether you're in a friction favor above a ring and ring or a rope sleeve or, um, pulley favor whether you've got more or less friction that also is going to have more or less friction depending on that depending on the weight of your person depending on how much stuff you have on your harness whether you like to go light and easy or you like to have the whole you know kitchen cabinet with you um, all of those sorts of things impact how all these ascenders work and what's more important is about how you're going to inspect them one of the biggest things with this particular tool is about the friction. So when they're brand new, they release really easy and they grab and there's no creep. What happens is when people get familiar with the way these devices work and then they, over time, six months, a year, whatever, they're into the tool and now they go to sit back down and it starts to creep, they freak out as they should. But you wouldn't know that um, unless, again, you are understanding how the friction happens with this tool. So those are the, the points that you really want to look at is, is, is how much metal is still there at the friction points, one. Two, obviously this flexes. We're, we don't just go up and down. We go out, we go upwards, we go sideways, we go all the different positions in the tree. So the other points that you really want to make sure that you're looking at with a really close eye is, again, all of those metal points on the outside of the chain, all those metal points making sure that there's no micro cracks or, or anything like that. The other thing, there's a different style of the zigzag tube. This one happens to be without the swivel on the bottom. Some come with the swivel on the bottom. You're also going to be looking at how that swivel connects to that lower part if, the, if you do have one, making sure all the metal's intact, making sure there's not discoloration, making sure that um, it moves as designed and intended, that it's smooth, that it, it rotates nicely, that there's no rough spots to it. What you're really feeling is any sort of burrs or metal missing or rough spots. Again, simple, simple stuff. Um, so zigzags are important to, to, to not only look at, but these points in particular at the brackets, incredibly important, the friction points here. And then a lot of times folks like mechanicals because when you're in sappy trees in the Northeast, in particular white pines, 
in other locations, um, if you're dealing with, well, any, any part of the pinus family, um, you're going to get sap. And they're easy to clean. And the biggest thing to, to understand is how to clean those is, is not with abrasive chemicals. It's with typically lukewarm water and um, um, a non-detergent-based soap. And with a soft toothbrush and a cloth, you can get off most of it. And why that's important is because um, this first spring action starts the process. And if that doesn't spring back, that is another critical component. So whether there's a rope in or rope out, that could be springing back very nicely. So keep that one in mind. So that's a zigzag. This device is a, a little bit different in terms of it can also be used for moving rope or a single rope. But uh, the zigzag has to actually pass through the whole entire line to get onto, your, onto the system. This one actually is a midline attachable line, which is pretty cool. Um, not all devices can do this, and that's one of the, the major um, critical component about why this is so fun, right? fun and different. Um, when you open it all the way and elongate it, you can actually pull these out. So as you can see, <coughs> got it. there are, if you will, bollards here that are not round, that actually have points to them, and then this one is a little bit off um, center. And so the neat part about this device is depending on if you're on a half inch line or if you're on a 7 16 line, that you actually have these positions in which you can adjust. Now you can imagine that with you adjusting these, that there are some things that can go uh, a little bit wonky. So in terms of gear inspection, you want to make sure that all of these pins, if you were to move these and rotate them, that they're actually locking into place. So dirt and grime and grit and stuff, well, we can get into every little crack and nanny everywhere into these any device, no matter what it is, whether it's your harness, your carabiner, or whatever. So you want to make sure it's clean. And you want to make sure that they close correctly. And you want to make sure that when, the, when those bollards <coughs> are collapsed on the rope, that there's no creep. If you're getting creep, first things first is you want to make sure that the adjustment points are correct. You might have climbed on a larger rope prior and now you went to a skinny rope because that was the flavor of the day and you've got a new rope and you want to try it on your Kimbo. So try the adjustment points. If you've adjusted the points and other things, you might just have too much wear and tear on the contact points and you might have worn it out so much that it's not grabbing anymore. So inspection. Just like the zigzag too, obviously, of course, you want to be looking at any any of the points where you're at having having a lot of um, wear and tear. So again, you're looking at any sorts of metal here, and though this is not a swivel here, this down here, um, this moves back and forth. So again, all the same things for any metal, all intact, no serious abrasion that's going on there, no burrs, no nicks, um, and then everything is smooth because again, it's going to interface with your rope. One of the other things about uh, the akimbo, though this is not a safety factor, this is just a, an FYI, this little little catch for your chest descender to help you elevate this tool as you go up the line is a really awesome feature. The one thing to keep in mind, however, is that that is designed to be used with a uh, small carabiner. And not all small carabiners play nicely with that, speaking from experience. Um, you'll really want to use either a Rock X or an accessory uh, DMME X, X S R E, an accessory beaner in there. And the idea is that when you sit back, it releases beautifully. If you overload that with a larger, small but larger carabiner, it won't, and you potentially could break that little beak. So that's a bummer. So keep an eye on that. Or if you're, somebody's about to borrow your Kimbo and they've got a larger size carabiner, you're like, no way! <laughs> so that's important. Um, the wrench, on the other hand, this is not life support. So the wrench is paired with a friction hitch underneath, um, but you, obviously you want it to run smoothly because it's interfacing with soft goods, your, your cordage. So to inspect uh, your rope, runner, uh, rope wrench, excuse me. And again, there are mother mechanicals out there, like I just said, like the rope wrench, the, uh, the unisender, uh, so many out there. Um, find what works well for you. Uh, but one of the things about the, the rope wrench is that when you depress the quick slick pin, 
and, and you turn it back into a second hole, is make sure that this is not filled with grime and grit. Make sure that there are no pitch and oils and things. Make sure that your, um, your, your pulley is moving nice and smooth, um, that there are no nicks and abrasions. And again, it's, it's interfacing with soft goods, so you want to make sure that the metal is, is intact and operating as, as intended. The other thing about wrenches is that there's this, with a tether that you've mashed them with, there's usually some sort of rubber bumper here, and that keeps it from collapsing down on your hitch, your quick hitch underneath it. So make sure that that is, is in good intact and it's not all dry rotted out. You might just have to replace that. And this tether, again, it's, it's not life support, but what it's also doing is that it's, uh, there often comes they are stitched. So make sure, <laughs> make sure your tools are in good operating condition and that all the stitching is present and that they're working together. Get in there. So. Still with me? Still paying attention? Okay, we're gonna get into carabiners. Now, carabiners are obviously um, not all created equal. There's all different cool parts um, to them. Some are push, some are pull, some are ball, some are different colors, different, different shapes, shapes too, in terms of size. So find the right one that works, that interfaces nicely with your equipment. Some have thicker spines than others, so they don't always work with every piece of gear. So if you don't know that, make sure you're matching it correctly. Um, some are wee and really small, so they move your system from being elongated onto your, if you have a rope bridge and it's already a long way, usually even taller carabiners, the system's going to be even further away. So some of them are nice and petite, a little small. They come in all different colors, so if you want to color match your stuff, that's great. Um, I tend to get into that little game because frankly it's fun. <laughs> um, some people who have issues with their hands, um, either they're having grip issues, they're having uh, repetitive motion in injuries, or they've had carpal tunnel issues in the past. These ball locks, they've now switched them, they've mixed them up a little bit. There's a rigid mark on the back and they also have a, a ball that you can just push in. I find from working with climbers that are older or maybe have some less efficient hands, uh, they find that that is easy for their person to open versus pushing up or pulling on a gate. So it's nice to have options. Um, it's nice to have options as well as different types of metal. So this particular one is made out of stainless steel and I like this one quite a bit. I use this on the lead of my climbing line. So I might use this in place of that. So I don't have to have a throw ball or anything else to throw my line up higher. But what I also find is that as I'm doing a gear inspection, one of the things that I'm looking for, of course, is that all the metal is intact, that the color is at least looking somewhat like it's supposed to. It's, it wasn't once orange and now it's silver. Um, keep in mind these carabiners are anywhere from 14 to $40 for the steel ones, but no more than $25. If you have a piece of uh, hardware that's not operating correctly after you've already done its maintenance and all that, um, it's time to get a new carabiner. Destroy it, get it out of purpose, put it in your, put it in, uh, put it in a, in a place where somebody might not pick it up and be like, ooh, a carabiner, and use it again. Spray paint it, do something so that somebody goes, ooh, I'm never going to use that thing, so that people understand that it's not for use, or uh, discard it. But you will see that this is supposed to be all stainless steel. It's got some sap and things on it. And what I want to show you is in terms of inspection is that they are built for a reason, that they're designed to do three distinct actions to open. So whether it's push up or pull down, twist, and then open, when you release this, you should be able to release it and slowly, and it close all the way. And for those eagle eyes over there, they're looking and going, you're right, it didn't close all the way. So I'm going to bring that closer to you so you can see. So they didn't close all the way. So is that carabiner any good? Well, frankly, I'm pulling down and it just closed there. But I got to do that again. So is this a quote unquote DQ? Is it a disqualification? Is it something I get out of service? The answer is not yet. What I'm going to do is gonna take some time. So I attended a really great presentation over the summer. <laughs> when virtual learning was just occurring uh, and Taylor Hamill from DMM gave a great presentation about carabiners 
and frankly, I've been doing this for a really long time, and I know a lot of things about carabiners, but some of the cool things I learned from him was not only how they're constructed, he broke down about all the pieces, parts, and why they do what they do, but more specifically, by learning that information, I learned, more importantly, how to clean them, which is so cool. I'd never heard anybody say, yeah, go ahead and give it a bath. I went, wait, what? So um, the, the DMM company, um, Taylor, was recommending that to have a lukewarm, not hot, not cold, uh, water bath and soak them. And basically what you're going to do is just try to separate the grit out of the carabiner first. You can either hang it up to dry, but when you hang it up to dry, think about how a carabiner works. You're not going to hang it up to dry with all the water going down into the gate, right, as it opens to the top. You want to hang it up to dry so all the water releases or moves from the, away from the gate like that, which again, haha, Captain Obvious, but cool tip. Um, additionally, one of the other things that I thought was really neat is that if you're in a rush and you need to have that carabiner and you don't have many others, that compressed air will work. If your goal is that you're not trying to blow the air into oblivion and make it turn into dust, you're just trying to move the air out. So again, same, same idea. The other thing that he talked about was for years and years I had always known that to use powdered graphite. And what they've recognized with carabiner failures that they receive from the field that they do investigations with, that when things get wet and dry and wet and dry, and we never work in adverse conditions ever, that when we're using powdered graphite, that those that powder does not interface nicely with moisture. And that they found is that there's caking that was occurring. And if you will, not only not allowing the carabiner to open and close effectively, but also potentially putting pressure on, if you will, the moving parts inside that are supposed to be springing back into action. So that was one thing that was really interesting. So no powdered graphite. And then two, another alternative that was often discussed was, of course, WD-40. It was designed by the Navy as uh, the formula of WD in the 40th time that they tried it. It was a water displacement product. Um, and though the idea of it was great, what they recognize again is that it dries things out. So not the right a tool for carabiner. So then there was a lot of discussion about three in one oil and why we may or may not use that. And what we just found is that three in one oil also can attract dirt. So in the short term, good in a pinch if you have nothing else, but long term, not good. So then what the heck do we use? Well, for the longest time, from I think from my personal perspective, I, had, I kept hearing this thing called duck oil. I was like, what the heck is duck oil? I don't even know. And it was impossible to find in the States. There are now a couple of purveyors that are selling that, so you can get that now. But also, uh, uh, Taylor was talking about a product called... Uh, Long SPL 100. What it is, is a high, um, high efficiency, high viscosity um, ballistic so a lot of um, people who are using machinery, guns, that kind of thing, or sewing machines, those kinds of tools where there's a, it's a high viscosity, it's called ProStep. And uh, they also work really well if you can't find duck oil. But uh, this particular one uh, um, it comes in with a little dispenser on the side. And what Taylor was saying, though, after you give it a clean, you really don't want any more than six drops max. I mean, we amounts, and hardly any at all. And you're going to be thinking about the pivot point. So at, at the ring, at the top of the gate, when you open the gate, in, inside the gate here, and on the, between the sleeve, and then on the back side, again, on the inside of the gate. So not a lot. So this, this carabiner and I have a gate with some water and some duck oil. <laughs> quack, quack. <laughs> carabiner. Uh, rope snaps. Please hold. The rope snap I was hoping to show you I don't have, but this is a fairly new kit um, product on the market. It's called uh, Petzl Open Snap. It called that. Guess why? Well, guess what? It opens. So similar to their rings that they use, this can be opened. This slight gray part can be pulled out. The beauty is that you can put a lanyard on it that's already got a sliced eye. Very cool if you're a person that likes snaps. And then you close that up. It's got an O-ring in there, so no Loctite. 
but the thing about rope snaps is of course you want to break the spine and then open the gate you don't want your carabiners to open without doing those two actions you can get some rope snaps now that have a three action um, isc makes one that you depress that first and then the back and then here personal preference um, i typically am not a rope snap person but I love using gear, and frankly, this device, I think, is a really nice match for meeting the efficiencies for certain people that want streamline and want a rope snap and want something that can interface with other types of hardware. So kudos to that manufacturer for coming up with that design. But the biggest thing is to understand is also in terms of inspection is when these devices pivot, if you will, that when they lock into place that there's over time that those those uh, wear points get a little bit more rounded a little bit more rounded a little less sharp and what I mean by sharp um, more defined excuse me better word a little less defined so over time they won't necessarily uh, have they will have more play when you push this the gate without depressing the spine you'll have more play and you'll see that more with the older larger red snaps or some steel snaps where some of your team will be able to press that and you'll actually see daylight not good you don't want to see any daylight so as you open up that the, the front of the gate without depressing the spine you don't want to see any daylight at all so rope snap working with a hitch climber pulley or uh, say for example a two hole pulley or a single pulley or or block when you're when you're inspecting these devices it's okay to have metal discoloration here on the wear point and it's it is okay according to dmm that you actually have some play of the cheek plates left and right it's when things start um you actually get burrs and, and nicks and things here and or um a significant amount of of warping or distortion on the holes and again the dmm was is is very um stands well behind their product as well as uh, the other metal manufacturers and what they're saying basically is if it, if it doesn't feel right frankly just why why are we even having a conversation about it i mean really but with that being said th this m in most configurations this is not life support this is acting as a tool that is often sliding a device it's a it's a hitch tender if you will it is that now it is life support because it's actually holding me to the rope so in in conjunction with my hitch it's also holding me as a system so you're looking at metal here is in this system is it critical that the pulley is operating correctly well it's just it's nice when it works correctly but this is what you're looking at in terms of the holes how you attach so it's important to understand about how your tools are being used and how you're inspecting them in terms of the life of the product and um, one neat thing is again me being geeky about equipment I've seen some hitch climber pulleys over time they're like oh my god that should just be old and somebody's like, yeah, but it's my favorite hitch climber pulley. I've had it forever. It's my favorite color, blah, 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 blah. Um, you can send these tools back to the manufacturers. They Obviously, they don't want you sending one every other day to have them take a look. But you can send them back to the manufacturers. And when you do that, they will give you input about the tools. They, the companies I cannot say enough about in terms of um, giving user feedback about their products. And frankly, they like seeing their tools used. And they like seeing them when they've had, you know, one, two, five, 20 years of use on a product and it's still not only alive and ticking, but it's worn well. <laughs> and they like giving that kind of feedback. So keep that in mind. Um, obviously, there are other people that like that weird stuff too. Friction savers. There's all different types of friction savers. You can have rope sleeves, ones that your rope actually pass through. You can have... Uh, pulley saver where your rope would you know go through cord edge and then pass and rotate through on the actual pinto pulley itself you could have a thimble saver where your rope would pass to through the two to the two thimbles you could have 
a webbing style um, friction saver in terms of uh, a, a ring and ring that's aluminum rings and you can have what most people think of originally which is a I don't know if it was the first design but it's definitely one of the first first designs out there um, whether they're steel rings or aluminum rings they made out of webbing the biggest thing with all of these different tools is to understand if you are through carrying rings or if you're still in your rope as your primary tying point but or it's just uh, something like a rope sleeve that's protecting it. it could be a leather horseshoe or whatever um, as you're inspecting it same thing goes across the board if it's webbing you want to make sure all the webbing's intact that you don't have abrasion on the sides and that the all this all the stitching is intact again all all captain obvious things very very important um, if they're steel they're going to be able to take more abuse simple as that if they're aluminum they're not as many of you know who's ever uh, installed a ring and ring friction saver when you go to snap it over the branch the rings come together that's what we all know and love about that sound is that you know that haha come together and now I can drop my throw ball and pull up my climbing line but when they do that that wear and tear you're also going to get wear and tear on the rings so whether it's aluminum or steel you'll want to be mindful of the kinds of wear and tear that you're putting on the rings these are not buy one last forever um, if you take exceptional care of your gear you can but um, note that there are times where you actually have to replace things and typically what it does is either there's a nick or, or a fray in the webbing and or that over time when these aluminum rings come together that they'll actually start to lose metal and then they'll actually get worn and when they start losing metal and worn that means it's going to be more premature wear and tear also on either the webbing itself or on your rope as it passes through the ring so keep that in mind so again that we have these ANSI standards we have these measures and protections to help us look at our tools with a critical eye share your knowledge with with folks and I just really wanted to say thank you for your time and your energy I hope I didn't bore you to death I hope you got some solid nuggets out of this presentation if anything else I hope you appreciated my little home, st home studio um, there's lots more that we could talk about but I have given you the nuts and bolts to not only help you keep yourself safe keep your teammates safe and help share the knowledge with others thank you have a great night